Greetings. Dan Polk here for American Peasants. Been out on my bicycle running some errands this morning. What a beautiful July morning. I think it's July 12th today on the southern Oregon coast. Beautiful blue skies. A lot to do in the garden and orchard, but I thought I'd talk about the bike first. You know, bikes give us back a lot. A lot more than just exercise or transportation. They're non-polluting. A steel bike is recyclable. This bike, which I will never sell, belonged to a friend of my brother Mike's, my big brother. And it's set up, I have it set up to run errands. There's a basket here, a carrier in the back. If we come in and get a shot of a couple things that are, I'd like to point out. Older folks in the crowd, in the audience might remember, this is a Bendix two-speed rear end, where you kick back. Let's just demonstrate. It has a, both the coaster brake and a second gear. So, called the kickback hub. So, I'm in first gear. See? There's second. There's first again. What a practical design. Fantastic practical design. As well as having a coaster brake built in. Now apparently, uh, Sturmy Archer's remanufacturing those. There's about $100 uh, involved. But a modern version of that, and maybe I'll set up a bike in the future with that. Anyway, enough on bikes. They're just great, great fun, and it's a link back to our childhood. Let's, uh, let's get into the garden, see what's going on. There's a lot to do. This is coming into what's called high summer. So things are growing faster, and there's a lot to keep up with. So let's get started. I'll just park that here for now. You know, in a small space, small garden, small little homestead and neighborhood house, things have to kind of be kept in their place so everything fits. And one of the first things we can see Compost is coming along well. I'll have to get some more horse manure because there's a constant turnover of scraps from the kitchen and I'll have to set up another bin. And this is what I'm talking about, about space. Now this cucumber started as a volunteer. I don't know where it came from, but it's just a magnificent example. I've got it in a tomato cage. But see, this is, this is where I bring my lawnmower out to get to the front yard to mow it. So I've got to do something to manage space here because the lawnmower won't fit through here. Gardening, intensive gardening on a small space is like, like living on a sailboat. Everything has to have its place. So I've got to figure out a strategy here. Onions are looking good. I think we'll dig in some fertilizer. Uh, we start to see uh, the bulbing process. And onions, as you recall from an earlier lecture, are photoperiodic. They respond to the length of day and Days are getting shorter and the bulbing's taking place. We gotta get these onions some nutrition and we'll try to do that later in this episode. Got some more beans started here uh, for our succession planning. And just a kind of an overview here. We'll come up, uh, up close and personal with the pole beans, but you'll recall when I had built the trellis and started the beans, they were small now as I had predicted. They're going to crawl all over, and they're not done growing, but let's just start right there if you come in a little closer here. And I'll try to find, which I noticed, all of these flowers will become, each one of these will become one of the Blue Lake pole beans. And I know that I saw some small beans start forming. Maybe we'll find those later. Yes, come, come around here. So this is a, that's a string bean forming right there out of one of those flowers. And soon the whole trellis will be covered. 
with the flowers and the beans. And pole beans are kind of like indeterminate tomatoes, which I'll talk about too uh, later with the tomatoes you see in the background. They just keep climbing, they keep growing, and they keep producing. Un unlike bush beans or determinate tomatoes, which kind of come on all at once, those are good for the home canner. We're going to mix up some fertilizer. Have our camera talent come around here. So you recall the first time we mixed the fertilizer, we were doing like a planting ratio where we had more cottonseed meal. It, we had four parts of the cottonseed meal. I think I've amended that now. This should just be one part, and I lost my marker. At any rate, one part of each of the cottonseed, the bone meal, the kelp meal, and we're going to leave out the lime because we had plenty of that to start with, and I think we've amended our, our acid soil with more alkaline condition. So one part of each, and this is going to be a, I've already got some mixed up here, this is going to be our mid-season flowering and fruiting mix, a one-to-one -one ratio. Again, cottonseed meal for our nitrogen promotes leafy growth. The bone meal for our phosphorus helps to build a strong plant overall. Same with the potassium in our kelp meal. The phosphorus in the bone meal can help our fruiting and flowering as well. So one of each. cottonseed meal. Now, you see with the video, you can always pause, bone meal. Take notes, rewind. That's the teacher in me. And then we're just going to mix together. Probably should figure out how we're going to apply. And how we're going to apply is with this fork. There's a lot of ways to do it, but just starting with the onions since they're nearby. Come over this way. You want to break up the soil. Add the fertilizer. Kind of scratch it in. Maybe a little more. And go right on down the line. tool like this, small hand trail, even your hands, get in and cultivate around whatever you're fertilizing. Work that fertilizer in, and when you water, there are organisms in the soil already. We'll start to break that down. When you water, then it helps, again, to further dissolve the nutrients for the plants that can start to take it up in their root system. I think we talked about the beans. A little tour. Uh, peas are coming along well. Maybe we'll start down here. Again, more peas. And again, you'll see it's still a little bit early. I don't think any of our peas will start to flower, but they will. And they're climbing. These are all climbing varieties. The two cucumbers are doing well. Another pea. Now, I, what I thought I'd do is talk a little bit about watering. And I've gone to the trouble, you know, earlier in our gardening season, we had just a watering can to be uh, distributing the water very delicately among the seeds, so we didn't disturb them. Now the plants are established and go to this like water wand, and this particular one has just an easy uh, valve operating right here with your thumb. That's the rain wand by DRAM. This is not an advertisement. Easily found at your local department stores, your nurseries and hardware stores. Anyway, I've gone to some trouble to cultivate around the plants again so we'd get that good absorption rate. Just took the hand trowel and dug around, loosened up the soil. And I like to use what's called the flood method, where you, you really soak the plants in. Again, coming on high summer, not a lot of precipitation here on the south coast. This is our dry season. So we have to provide that water for our garden. And uh, more infrequent deep watering is better than frequent shallow waterings. Beans, 
are shallow rooted. So they need maybe relatively more water. And it's a bigger plant as well. So this is maybe, what I'm showing you is maybe 50% of what I'd actually do. But beans you want to water on the ground. You want to water down the root zone and keep it off of the leaves because beans can be prone to disease, different viruses and things. So again, the flood irrigation method. More infrequent, deeper waterings rather than, and I could go on another five minutes just on this row, rather than frequent shallow waterings because you want the water to get down where the plants are actually taking it up in the roots. We haven't talked much about container gardening. When I had a couple of examples here, these are tomatoes. Now, I didn't start these. These were bought in the nursery. But in containers, obviously, I mean, they're being very, very productive, aren't they? They've set, and there's a couple reasons for that. They set a lot of fruit, and they need watering as well. How do you water in a container? Well, number one, I asked my grandma one time. I said, Grandma, how often do you water tomatoes? When should you water? She said, when they're dry. So tomatoes need to go through a wet and dry cycle. You don't want to water each day. You want to let them dry and then water. But container gardening of any kind can dry out faster. What do we look for when we're container gardening and water? We want the water to start running out of the holes in the bottom. Because it's soaked all the way through. See? Same thing with this one. That's where this handy valve comes in. Because we don't want to over, overflow or over flood the meter. And we're starting to trickle out the bottom. Of those drain holes. Drainage is important. Roots can rot and you can drown a plant with too much water couple different distinctions on tomatoes. I believe this is a Willamette. This one I think was developed at Oregon State University. This is a very famous early girl tomato. Uh, really good ex uh, exemplars of two, the two different types of tomatoes and their growth habits. This is called a determinate tomato because it's more of a bush and requires less support. There is a, there is a stake, a small stake there. Really not necessary. Again, this is going to come on all at once. The early girl is a classic example of an indeterminate tomato. Very viney. It's going to keep growing. I just staked it up again with some string. But keep your eye on it and because it's just going to want to crawl all over. And the, at this time we can take away anything that doesn't have a flower on it, really. That's looking much better already. With the early girl, which again will continue to set fruit I can tell this really needs some water this morning. This will continue to set fruit all the way until it gets too cold. And in the past, I've had tomatoes, fresh tomatoes, at Thanksgiving time, if we get unusually temperate here. Those will go in the compost later. On to some of our greens. The beautiful red speckled lettuce here. And I got some romaine lettuce coming on. I've got the beets, as well as the beet greens, which are good for salad. So I'm just distinguish between them. And we're going to do a little, do a little harvesting this morning. And we're going to also talk about how you make a fresh green salad. Start anywhere you like. There's a lot of talk about tearing the lettuce rather than cutting it. I like to cut it. It's easier. Watch out, though, because with a sharp pair of scissors, I've also whacked my fingers open. A little this nice romaine. And really there's always, I'm always trying to figure out how do I get just the right amount of anything. And we got an overabundance again, so some of this have to go to friends. A few of the beet greens. I think we can pick some beets today as well. We had a little bit trouble with a pest called a leaf miner, which has got into the spinach and into the beets, but it seems to be resolving itself. 
just trimmed away some of the disease material. Beet green, see? Let's see what we can find, and we're not quite done with our greens. Let's see what we can find with the, the uh, root part of the beets. And there are a few ready. You can look for the big ones or you can just thin. That one can come up. Oh, got a couple there, that's okay. Earlier, you pick beets, the less chance of them to be woody inside, these will be beautiful. And we can use the greens again in our salad. But I don't want to get these greens all dirty, so I think I'll just set these by. Segue into our next segment. So, potatoes and carrots. Now, some of the carrots are there's also some volunteer cilantro, which we should probably grab, too. Potatoes are really, really vigorous this year. Maybe a little too, soil is a little too rich. But they're starting to cover up and shade out the carrots. So we've got to whack. See, again, in intensive gardening, one plant is going to compete with the other. You've got to be strategic about this. And the potatoes, believe me, will survive. It's hard to eradicate all the potatoes from a garden. They're going to come up again. You leave fragments of them. They're going to come up again year after year. And they did this year. So that was no exception. And again, our somewhat hopefully approaching biodynamic system where everything feeds back into the system itself. These will go back into the compost. And now the carrots, and as the day advances, they'll definitely be able to get the light that they need. As you can see, there's a little weeding to do here. When we pull up a dandelion, what do we do? We try to get the whole root. If you break this off, they're very adaptable. They'll just come right back up again. With the raised beds, the soil is soft enough where you can do most of the weeding by hand. And you don't trample on the bed. You don't compact the soil. That's better. So the carrots are all also looking lovely. Get out of there. Why is weeding important? Well, weeds compete for moisture. They compete for... Put this over here in this pile. My pile. They compete for nutrition. They compete for sunlight. So, if you don't address them, they're going to take over because compared to a tender garden plant, a weed is much more vigorous and adaptable and needs less moisture and less nutrition than everything else. So if you feed it and water it, it's quickly going to outpace your garden crops. Where is mine? Okay. Let's finish with the salad greens. Spinach again is looking good. Full of vitamin A, vitamin K, I think. I mean, how much spinach can you eat? And then kale, which is one of the cabbage family. Deep green, very vigorous. Seems to be almost more like a wild plant because this 
if taken care of, this will grow this big. And it'll grow well into the winter. So a very, very substantial leafy green. That is our salad mix. And all lovely, all organic, no pesticides. This is boutique stuff. We'll be moving out into the orchard. That's the garden segment for this morning. And thanks for watching. Hello, I'm Dan Pope for American Peasants. Here it is. We're right in the first part of summertime. Summer's definitely upon us. And we're out here in the orchard in the front yard, the home orchard. And I'm going to emphasize again just how much we can do on a small parcel of land. Uh, cut away again to the satellite shot. And you can see again to the left of the house, that's the, the red box. That's the orchard that we're standing in. Then you can see the house, and then to the right of the house is the vegetable garden. We'll get there later in the episode. There's just so much to do, I don't know where to start. I remember when we were kids, you always start with the hardest thing first. And the hardest thing is uh, the orchard hygiene. That's the most difficult task. And there's a lot of windfall here, if we can get a shot of this. Uh, there are apples all over the ground, and uh, we're going to get those picked up. But uh, Maybe you could start just with a little word on the tree and why and what's going on. I, by my best uh, estimate, this is uh, Dorset Golden, and it's a super early apple. It's uh, July 5th, and uh, 4th of July was just last night, but uh, the apples are falling all over the ground, and they're ripe and they're ready to eat. I have never, it was sold to me as a, as a yellow transparent, which is a variation of Golden Delicious, but I have never seen such an early apple. I've been into, interested in apples my whole life. Never seen such an early apple. At any rate, let's get the hard stuff out of the way, and then we'll do a little tour of the orchard, and then we'll end up uh, with the orchard end of the orchard sequence with this Santa Rosa plum, and we're going to do some picking. I'll be up in the tree, and I'll talk about the ladders and moving things around. Let's look at what we got for equipment here. Here's just a utilitarian five-gallon bucket, and then this is for all of the cast off fruit. This might be for the good fruit we pick up off the ground. This is my picking bag for being up in the tree and actually collecting tonight. Beautiful evening here at 7.30 on the southern Oregon coast. And then this is going to be for the finished fruit. We'll see what we can put together with about half an hour of work out here. So let's get started. And again, just sorting through, what I'm going to do is take some time here sort through all the fruit that I don't want. And that that I do want. Again, good stuff goes in here and the cast off fruit will go in here. And so I'm going to get started and you'll see me doing a little bit of this and we'll come back and have some commentary later. So why the orchard hygiene? Why is this important? Well, because insect pests and diseases can live on in the fruit that's all over the ground. We want to keep that picked up, and then we just don't have to step on it when we're working out here. And I might also add that uh, all of the orchard and garden are all organic. I don't use weed kill or anything else out here, and it probably shows the yard's a disaster. But the orchard is set up for production rather than aesthetics, and I think it's good to Probably, I could probably strike a balance between the two, but if I had to pick one, it's going to be that heavy mass of fruit production every year. And this is work. It is physical work, but again, we're stretching. We're using our muscles. We are working on flexibility, getting our lungs full of air. It's really, actually, it's, it's not easy work, but it's enjoyable work. It gives you also some understanding of the plight of the farm worker has to do this all day long for very little money. And that's the produce we see in the supermarkets. Those people work like slaves. Well, we can do it for ourselves. Quality is better, and we feel better about providing for ourselves when we get back to work. And not only the migrant workers have to pick all, but they got to sort through it, and then sort it again when they're, you know, grading it and packing it. But it's all quite a bit of work, actually. What's remarkable is how 
edible most of this stuff is. So we're up on the ladders and my strategy this year is just to pick everything I can see that's red because, and this is what commercial orchardists do with, with the big plantation style orchards is they is they just pick everything, even stuff that's green because fruit will, almost all fruit will ripen in the bag. And I have waited in the past to, to, to it's soft and ready to eat and that was a mistake because then there's an overabundancy and I don't know what to do with it all and I got to pick it all at once. But if I just start picking and I pick everything that I see that's got red on it, you want some kind of a bag or something where you can get both hands free and we can sort it out later. But the idea is just to get as much of it off the tree as you can from the position that you're in at the time. That was a three-pointer there. At this point. A bag with one strap is good because you can move it around and you want to do that for two reasons. Number one, because we get tired, and then two, just for access. I mean, there's just so much on here. Again, last year, the bloom was in April, and it was very, it was very dry, and so there's a lot of pollination. There's probably twice as much fruit on this tree, if you can believe it, as there is now. And I could absolutely could not keep up with it. This year I was actually relieved that we had a little bit of rainy weather during our bloom, and the pollination on the fruit set wasn't quite as good, which is really a blessing, because last year was just too much. And I took some to the homeless, and I, get, I can't tell you how many 20 pound bags that I gave away to friends. And of course, that's the other thing. You know, if you have the time, I just have so much going on here. I, I can't devote all my time to one tree. But I have another life outside of the garden orchard as well. It enriches my life, it's not my whole life. That it's, there's one that's not gonna, Whoops, missed that one, air ball. That if you have the time, you can grow so much on a small parcel, as we'll see, that you could potentially have a farmer's market situation, or you could do community-sponsored agriculture, or just, again, help to feed, feed your friends and family, because it's all here for the taking. The work in, equals the joy and product that comes out. Well, we're not finished. That was maybe 10 minutes of picking, and we'll move on. But we should probably weigh this. That's just so lovely. Again, that's in the store, market value, that's at least just say conservative estimate, two dollars a pound. That I'm going to say that's at least 15 pounds. We'll go put it on the scale and find out. So that's 30 dollars worth of produce right there. And that's year after year. And again, what can we do for ourselves? Remember what President Truman said: We must do all we can to cut down on the cost of living. So we have all the plums in our picking bag, and we're going to put them in this a little bit better uh, visual for us and then we're going to put them on the scale. Now we want to proceed with caution, and we can bruise these, right? And separating the leaves, a bit of byproduct there, from the plums, this is what we're left with. I mean, that's just unbelievable. Well, there's at least, there's at least two more pickings like this. 
this was about 10% of the yield last year. And again, I'm relieved that it's not quite as heavy this year. Let's go put this on the scale and see what we got for our labors tonight. So here we are, this big tub of lovely Santa Rosa plums that we just picked, and let's see how we did. Put those on our high-tech 995 bathroom scale. Looks like we're almost 20 pounds, 18, 19 pounds. Conservatively speaking, at $2 a pound and many domestic markets even higher, that's between $30 and $40 worth of fruit. Not too bad. Signing off now for American Peasants, this is Dan Polk.